Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dev Talks. I am Eliana Ferrara, and I'm a professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. It is a great pleasure today to be welcoming Dr. Joe Hendrick from Harvard University for a session that will largely revolve around his book titled The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous. Uh, thanks to the Growth Lab for having me and for being flexible on the format. So uh, the, the initial, there was going to be more discussion, but one of my goals here and, and why I'm so excited to be talking to a diverse group with policy interests and interest in economic development is that I come from the field of cultural evolution, which is a, a kind of newly emerging discipline. And I think it can provide a valuable framework, but most of you are probably unfamiliar with cultural evolution. So I wanted to do a little bit of groundwork and kind of lay some of that out. So I'll be drawing on both books and we'll spend some time on the weirdest people in the world. But this book really provides the framework for thinking about culture and cultural evolution. Now, I thought since the group is maybe half economists, I would make this my outcome variable and just start thinking about the things that influence economic growth. And my kind of uh, prelude or preamble is going to be based on a new paper where we just try to establish a simple and robust connection between family structures around the world, traditional family structures, and economic growth. So I'm drawing here on a, a paper uh, with Duman Barani Ra, Jonathan Beecham, and Jonathan Schiltz. And we're gonna argue that uh, we should think about kinship norms as kin-based institutions, so culturally transmitted social norms that shape things like marriage, the organization of family, some societies have clans, kindreds, different marriage systems, and different forms of customary inheritance. I'll be talking about this more, but the key dimension we want to try to measure is kinship intensity. And this is actually a concept from anthropology. So we're going to combine an economic problem with an idea from anthropology and see if we can look for a link here. Ultimately, I'll be arguing that economic growth is generated when there's a fit between informal institutions like kinship and the psychology that they produce, the kinds of social networks they produce, and larger scale impersonal institutions, things like democracy. Uh, or the organization of business firms. So as an as a outcome measure, as an initial outcome measure, we're going to use this uh, nighttime satellite luminosity, um, which has been widely used now. It's, uh, it's a, you know, it gives us a fine-grained pixel-level measure of economic prosperity. It correlates strongly with other measures of economic growth and prosperity. And in the paper I'm referring to, we also use regional G uh, GDP measures from Genioli 2014, which gives us over 1,500 different regions in 84 countries. And we perform a bunch of analyses linking these two in the paper. Um, now, kinship intensity, as I mentioned, uh, well, many of you, if you're from societies that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, a lot of this talk about kinship may seem strange because those societies are at the extreme end of low kinship intensity where the family has been suppressed and doesn't play an important role in uh, distribution, consumption, networks, all kinds of things like that. So we're gonna measure kinship intensity by looking at the presence of clans, cousin marriage, rules about post-marital residence, where you live after you get married. Do you live near uh, the bride's family or the groom's family? Uh, do you have polygyny? And uh, what kind of inheritance system do you have? Patrilineal, matrilineal, inheritance by testament. So we're gonna measure this kinship intensity from this anthropological data source composed in the 1960s, um, which is gonna, has a whole bunch of information about kinship. And when I first went to graduate school, I was like, why are anthropologists so obsessed with kinship? And then I went to do research in the South Pacific and I'm like, oh, because the people are obsessed with kinship. And so they write about what the people obsess about. And so there's lots of data in the ethnographic atlas on that. The year um, which most of these observations refer to is 1900. So it's going to precede our satellite observations, our nighttime luminosity measures, which are 2010. We're also going to be drawing this kinship intensity measure from a, a paper by Jonathan Schultz, myself, and others. Actually, it's the same co-authors uh, that we published in Science. So in that sense, we're going to tie our hands, right? We have to use the exact same measure that we used in the science paper. So we can't kind of fudge around with the index at all. Uh, and we're also going to take data from genetics. So my colleague, David Reich, uh, who's over in the Department of U uh, Human Evolutionary Biology, has put together the largest data set of human genetic data. And these kinship practices leave an imprint in the genome, which is one way to kind of assess that what these anthropologists report is actually affecting things. 
because it's going to shape the, the lengths of runs of homozygosity, both polygyny and cousin marriage and other kinds of endog endogamous marriage preferences should do that. So we're going to use that and we're just going to substitute this in sometimes for that. Okay, so uh, standard issue economic regression table. Hopefully at least half of you are familiar with these. Uh, I'll just walk you through some of the key insights. So we're trying to predict this pixel level luminosity, so the logarithm of pixel level luminosity. We're using this kinship intensity index from the uh, anthropologists in the 1960s that we've used to assign ethnic groups all around the world a uh, measure of, of kinship intensity. And so by putting this here and noticing that this is about one, this coefficient here, we can interpret this as a, as a prosperity per capita. So it's luminosity per capita. So that's that. And then uh, this is our coefficient here. So a one standard deviation increase in kinship intensity across societies results in a 40% decrease in luminosity. So if you buy that as a measure of economic prosperity, there's a relationship there. Now we estimate a whole bunch of different um, uh, specifications, different models. We always, we put in country fixed effects. So we're comparing only ethnic groups in the same country. Uh, we can't, we control for a whole bunch of the standard geographic controls, political hierarchy, malaria index, stuff from other, other work that could be uh, leading us astray. And then we take that out, we use the exact same model, and then we stick in our F value. And we're able to show that that gives the same result. And then we do the same thing with our satellite luminosity. We take that out, same specification, plug in the G and only regional stuff. You have to make a few adjustments, but you get basically the same answer. So that's, that's suggesting that there's this robust linkage there. Um, there's some details about how we match the ethnographic atlas that I'm gonna pass over for our purposes here. Now, the other thing we did that helps us maybe think that this is, there's really something to this, this ancestral kinship intensity affecting contemporary economic outcomes. We do what's called a, a, a spatial regression discontinu discontinuity analysis. So we look at the borders between our ethnic groups uh, and we only focus on groups within countries. So there's no country level differences here. And we compare and we look at what happens when we move from a, a, a population that has a low kinship intensity, so small, maybe monogamous nuclear families, to a group with clans or something like that, some intensive group. And what we find, you can see pictured here, is that there's a drop in, uh, in luminosity. So you have less economic prosperity as you move from groups with, high, with low kinship intensity to high kinship intensity. So that's consistent with the other results. We can you know, do the full analysis and, and that's the basic answer we get. Uh, these coefficients here are just the KII when you cross that uh, the effect there. Okay, so that suggests that there's a linkage here. Now, why is that the case? Lots of economists and others have argued that, well, it has to do with differences in innovation, specialization, political institutions, trade. And so there's a causal relationship there, potentially. I leave that to other people. I'm interested in how these affect this. So in The Weirdest People in the World, I make the case that different kinship norms create an environment that leads to different ways of thinking about the world. And then that leads to more or less innovation, specialization, different functioning political institutions, and more or less trade. These can also be seen in social networks. So these have a huge and direct effect on your social networks. And so these two co-evolve. Um, where's my arrow? Okay, there it is. Now, I'm also going to think about where kinship norms come from. So there's a lot of reason to think ecology matters and that'll pop up at one point, but I'm mostly interested in the historical effect of religions. Religions have been very opinionated about marriage and the family, especially as you move through time over the last few millennia. So we'll get into the Catholic church, but other religions also have opinions. So we can think about how different religious traditions may have affected things through kinship norms. One of the challenges with, if you look across the social science, I think is how people think about culture. When I first started in anthropology, culture felt like this sort of murky thing that sort of looms almost like a haze around people. It's hard to get, you know, my, my background is aerospace engineering. That I was an engineer for a while before going into this business. And uh, so I want things to be concrete and measurable. Uh, so I found this work by, uh, yeah, I ended up working closely with Rob Boyd and Pete Richardson. And also there's other work by two biologists, Cavalli, Swartz, and Feldman. And they said, well, culture is this stuff that resides in individuals' heads. And it gets transmitted from one person to another while you're growing up, but also while you're an adult. So it's about how you learn from people. So you can build models of cultural evolution, 
by understanding how people learn from each other and then cobbling up thinking, okay, people interact, they learn, they do stuff, they interact again. And how can that get us to explain sociological phenomena? And what we know from a lot of research now is people automatically and unconsciously learn all sorts of things. So they learn motivations, valences, ideas, beliefs, and values. They also learn decision-making biases and heuristics and the kinds of things that directly affect people's decision-making. So culture here is information stored in people's brains that got there via social learning. And so with that definition, technologies fall into this, languages fall into this, fertility preferences or any traits that influence fertility. I'm just throwing those out there because often sometimes people try to carve those out of culture. So anything we socially learn from others, we acquire while growing up. Of course, institutions are shaped strongly by social norms. All right. So now, the, where the evolution comes in and why I think that's really important is how do we decide how people learn from each other? Well, I mean, when I talk to economic theorists who think about this, they'll just make an assumption or they'll assume people are rational. What we do in the cultural evolution field is we recognize that we're a kind of ape and that natural selection has shaped our minds to be good at learning from others. So more than any other species, we're awesome at imitation. We're awesome at inferring the underlying uh, motivations and strategies that others have. And we copy those all the time and outside of conscious awareness. We're particularly tuned into copying some kinds of people and not other kinds. So we use cues of shared dialect or prestige to figure out who to pay attention to. So we can use evolutionary theory and build formal models that tell us what this should look like. And then of course, we have other features of our evolved psychology that are gonna affect behavior. And this is gonna be really important for kinship. Now the product of this cultural evolution creates things like complex tools, rituals and practices, but also social norms at institutions, as well as languages. And this is the world in which kids are evolved in. And so the argument that's in the secret of our success is we have these big brains and we have a great deal of plasticity because we need to learn how to navigate the world built by cultural evolution. And of course, cultural evolution has built lots of different worlds and it's been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years. So our minds have evolved to figure out how to navigate these worlds. And some things we know, we know that the illusions that people see across societies vary. So if you read a, look at a textbook on cognitive psychology, you might see something like the Mueller liar illusion, which has the arrows in or the arrows out. Well, and if you're in Chicago, you'll, you have to see what one line has to be 25% longer than the other line before people perceive them in Chicago as the same length. If you study hunter gatherers, they don't see the illusion. So basic visual perception depends on the world you grow up on. Self-regulation is affected by religious devotion. People who engage in daily religious devotion have greater self-regulation, it's a cultural practice. Same thing with the others. I could go into secret of our success gets into some of those. All right, and the last thing I'll mention is that we're at the stage in the evolution of the social sciences where we have to get rid of the, the dualism, the you know, culture on one hand, biology on the other hand. When we grow up in these worlds, it changes our brains. So you can take genetically identical twins, raise them in two different societies, they end up with different brains. So that's just, that's just a fact. Okay, and then my interest is actually, I think this has been going on for a really long time. So I'm interested in how this has shaped uh, features of human psychology. All right. Okay, and I'll just make a comment on the culture and institutions question, just because this is, seems to be an ongoing issue in economics. From the perspective that I've tried to lay out here, there's no, is it institutions or is it culture? Because institutions are a product of cultural evolution. So people learn from each other and this gives rise to social norms. What are social norms? So they are, uh, you acquire both the behavior, um, don't eat pig, and the rules for judging other. Pig eaters are bad news. And so then you get a social norm that prevents some group from eating pig. It's, it's enforced, it's self-reinforcing, and you can build game theoretic models, it'll remain stable, that sort of thing. Uh, so that gives rise to norms, collections of norms that govern a domain or an institution. So marriage, societies have had marriage institutions for as long as we can figure, uh, and marriage is governed by where the, where the couple lives after they get married, who pays, bride price or dowry. There's all these rules surrounding marriage. It's an institution. So formal institutions, the only difference is, is there, you can write stuff down and then future generations can interpret it. All right. Now, kin-based institutions, are, I'm going to argue, are special as institutions go because we have an evolved psychology that we share with other animals to preferentially be altruistic towards those who are genetically related to, so those who have a probability of sharing the same altruistic genes. 
quite a bit of research on that, but kinship systems extend that. So lots of societies will call cousins brothers or sisters, and you're supposed to treat that person like a, like a classificatory sibling. You're also not supposed to have sex with them if you call them sister and you're a male or vice versa. Um, we also have a pair bonding instinct and marriage builds on that. So like gorillas who also have a pair bonding instinct, we form long-term emotional bonds for the purposes of child rearing and protection. And then marriage formalizes that, reinforces it, et cetera. And then finally, incest aversion. Like other animals, we have to avoid uh, inbreeding with close relatives. So we have an innate aversion that we develop towards uh, siblings, people who grow up in the same household with, but that can be extended uh, and created in incest taboos and apply to in-laws, apply to cousins, other, other members of the group. And even hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari would, if you ask them about sex with a cousin, they'd be like, well, that's like having sex with my sister. And they'll, they'll actually make the link. And everybody knows what that sounds like, you know, the sibling, what that feels like. So anyway, these structure human social networks and they're highly variable across human societies. It's good to ask why, and that's one of the things I want to do. And then finally, one of the arguments in the weirdest people in the world is that the emergence of pre-modern states were really built on the logic of kin-based institutions. So lower strata and upper strata, think about kings and queens and marrying cousins and lineages and all that stuff. And of course, the lower strata worked as a productive unit. They'd re you know, arranged marriage, that kind of thing. And it was really this thin layer of in impersonal institutions sandwiched between two versions of complex kinship that made pre-modern states work. And it's hard to get to modern states if you have all this complex kinship operating in the background. So part of this is an argument about where modern states can come from. Okay, now all of this talk about kinship and clans and stuff may seem unusual to at least some of you uh, because you come from these weird societies. And just to give you a sense of how unusual it is, these are a set of kinship traits that vary around the world and bilateral descent. So tracing descent through mom and dad, most societies haven't had that. They've had something else, patrilineal descent, matrilineal descent. So that's rare. Cousin marriage, 75% of societies have some form of cousin marriage. In some places it's preferred. Monogamous marriage, 85% of human societies have allowed high status elite males to take additional wives. Nuclear families, rare yet. 92% of societies haven't had nuclear families or organized in some kind of extended family and neolocal residents. So that's when the bride and the groom live separate uh, from either the bride or the groom's family. And that's even more rare. If we look at the world as presented in the ethnographic atlas, most societies have none of these weird traits. So 51%, 50.1% of societies have zero. If we look down at other societies that have five, they're either European descent societies that appear in the ethnographic atlas, or they're places where usually Spanish missionaries have arrived early. So I actually found there's this island of Cebu, which has weirdly five of these, the, all five of these traits. So I went and did research on it. And I went to Antonio Pigfetta's Journal of Magellan's Chronicles. And he records polygyny like crazy and cousin marriage and all that stuff in Cebu. But then the Spanish Dominican missionaries got there. And by the time the anthropologist wrote stuff down, the Spanish missionaries had, had done their bit. Okay, so families are a great place to start because they're where children are born into. So they're the first institution kids encounter and they're historically the oldest institution. So everything we know is that some societies only have kin-based institutions. All right, so where did they come from? A common assumption is that these come from wealth. People get rich and then they start living in monogamous nuclear families. That's what everybody wants to do, right? Um, but there's good reason to believe, and historians and anthropologists have long argued that it was actually the action of the Roman Catholic Church, one branch of Christianity, that dissolved the complex kinship networks of Europe into monogamous nuclear families. And one fun piece of evidence is, the, you know, all of us speak English, we know the term for affine, so that's the anthropological term. But if you're, the, where does the in-law come in sister-in-law or brother-in-law or father-in-law? It comes from in-canon law. So every time you say sister-in-law, you're channeling the Catholic Church's taboo on sex with your sister-in-law or sex with your brother-in-law, uh, because that was supposed to remind you, treat her like a sister, you can't marry her. Important because even in the Bible, there were forms of marriage where uh, if your husband died, you'd marry his brother. So le leveret marriage, sororal marriage, very common across societies. Church does away with it. You're also maybe familiar with the, the common thing in, in, in marriage ceremonies, Oftentimes the priest or preacher will say something like, if anyone here can show just cause 
why this couple should not be lawfully joined together in holy matrimony, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. That comes from the Carolingian Empire's effort to root out incest, meaning marriage with cousins. Um, and it's, it's a, you get everyone together and you say, okay, are these two related in any way? Does anybody know how they might be related? And that's essentially what that is. Uh, so eventually the church begins in late antiquity, bans first cousin marriage, but it eventually goes out to six cousins and then it contracts a bit in 1215 uh, down to third cousins, but still pretty broad incest taboos. Remember, most societies have cousin marriage, 75% of them. Uh, polygamy also is banned. Europeans had polygamy like crazy, secondary wives, all that kind of stuff before the church. Um, no arranged marriages. So very common cross-culturally. The church required brides, so the, the Christian marriages still have the bride has to say, I do at one point. Most societies don't ask the bride her opinion. Um, but so the church forces that, and the priest is supposed to be checking, right? Okay, you're good with this, right? Um, and the church also discourages corporate ownership. So they wanted people to be able to give the church land. And if the uncles can get a hold of the land after their brother dies, the church can't get their hands on it. So they, they try to confine ownership to the individual and prevent collateral inheritance. So the, the, the great book to read about this is uh, Jack Goody's uh, Development of the Church and Family, or the Family and Marriage in Europe. Oh gosh, what happened to this slide? Um, okay, so this is just the same thing I was showing you before, and I'm gonna focus on this link and this link. All right, so the first thing that I may need to persuade you of is that there's a lot of psychological variation around the world. And if you didn't know about this, you'd be forgiven because if you take a course in social psychology, there's a social psychology text which presents it as if this is how people think when actually it's how weird people think. Uh, so just to give you a sense, this is a measure of individualism around the world. 96% um, of psychology studies are with European descent populations, the US primarily. Uh, so they're studying some of the most psychologically unusual populations around the world. Similar things with differences between trust in your out group versus trust in your in group. This affects beliefs and preferences. Uh, so here I'm thinking of economists, but if you're a cognitive scientist, it also affects attention, memory, perception, reasoning, decision styles, and, and a challenge. I have yet to find a decision-making heuristic prevented by the, found by the behavioral economist that doesn't vary across societies. There's either no evidence or I can show you there's variation. Uh, and I'm gonna focus on individualism, impersonal trust, conformity, and, and patience, which at least to an intuitive first approximation might affect economic outcomes. Okay, now one thing I have a caveat, which is that um, people from societies tend to think traits that promote success in their society are good. Uh, and so they tend to negatively balance things. And some people will think, you know, well, why are you saying bad things about these people calling them conformists? Uh, you know, if thinking of a more conformist society, but in those societies, being a conformist is good. So um, conformity is well studied. So if you show Americans, parents with their child behaving in a conformist way in a non-conformist way, the American parents like the non-conformist. They'll be like, that kid's smart, you know, he, we, we like that kid. Whereas if you go to other societies and show a conformist and a non-conformist child, you know, same videos, they pick the other kid. So there's just a, a lot of variation in that. So you're, when you call someone a conformist, it could be a compliment or it could not be. Uh, I'm not making any, any, any normative claims at all, but uh, merely to point out that's an important thing. People project their weirdness on other, elsewhere. Okay, now I wanna give you a sense of why our psychology would vary. So I'm gonna think about an intensive kin-based society and a weak kinship society. So in an intensive kinship society, you get your relationships at birth. And a lot of life is about figuring out how to navigate those relationships, live up to your responsibilities. Um, you conform to the roles and obligations of the society. It might be why conformity is good because you're trying to you know, not shame anybody. Now in a weak kinship society, you don't have very many family connections. You have to find your, uh, mates and friends and partners and all that kind of thing by cultivating a set of attributes that make you interesting to other people. So maybe you want to be creative or trustworthy or honest, things that allow you to find partners that set you apart. You know, why would I be your friend when I can be so-and-so's friend? They're, you know, they have more things to offer. But in this world, the roles are assigned mostly at birth, so you don't have that problem. Seek others based on attributes and mutual interests. Seek new relationships based on existing network connections. 
So in lots of places, you're not worried about whether someone has a trustworthy disposition. You want to have a lot of social connections to them because if you do, you know they'll behave in a business relationship, say, or in other kinds of relationships. It's the linkage between uh, people. So trust is based on embeddedness and trust based on dispositions. Uh, this, these tend to be shame oriented. So you're trying to not violate social norms. If you do, other members of your family could experience shame. So social standards here. Here, guilt is often your personal standards. So I might feel guilty for not going to the gym because I'm trying to stay in shape, uh, but my neighbor doesn't care about that. And if they find out my brother's not gonna experience shame, but I, I'm feeling guilt, something like that. Uh, and here your identity is based on relationships and network. And here it's that set of cultivated traits. I'm a scientist, I'm a kayaker, that sort of thing. Okay, now empirically, the case we set out for ourselves in the science paper was we needed to connect the church to kinship. We need to be able to connect kinship to weird psychology. And if both of these hold, we should also be able to do this. So uh, we have the kinship intensity index, which I told you about. We also got a lot of data on cousin marriage. We can do that within Europe based on dispensation requests. And then we also have measures from this biologist named Biddles. And then we have measures of the duration of the church's marriage and family program, which we can calculate globally or within different European regions based on the diffusion of bishoprics. I'll say more about that in a second. So this just gives you a sense of cousin marriage around the world. Uh, one in 10 marriages even today is between cousins. Uh, the Pashtun in, uh, in Afghanistan, 52% cousin marriage. So that's the, the Taliban is a Pashtun organization. So uh, I want to avoid doing, I could show you tons, I could show you 17 different plots like this for um, uh, 17 different psychological variables cross nationally. But let me summarize all that, and it summarizes nicely by this plot. More centuries under the church for a population, less cousin marriage. The same would be true if I put kinship intensity as measured from the ethnographic atlas. So that link holds cross-nationally. More cousin marriage, less individualism and impersonal psychology. So people are less individualist, more relationally oriented. And then finally, we can go this way. And in all of our analysis, we always do the Eastern church, which had a kind of soft, less enthusiastic version of the marriage and family program that the Western church imposed to dismantle the family structures in Western Europe. So you often see a weak but positive correlation with the Eastern church, and then the strong result with the Western church. So at the cross nat, we see lots of variation cross nationally. It roughly seems to pattern how we think it might pattern. But we wanna dig in and see if we can get closer to you know, build more confidence in that there's really a relationship here. So my collaborator, Jonathan Schultz, created a database of the diffusion of Catholic bishoprics through Europe. So we have a GPS location and a year. And so we can use that to assign a dosage to each place. And this is actually spiraling through time. So it just started. You'll see certain places turn gray. That's because that part of, the, of Europe was under a political power unfriendly to the Bishop of Rome. So the Pope in Rome. You'll see Southern Spain deal with uh, uh, Sicily. Uh, well, Sicily is under Islamic powers. Okay, so you get this variation in dosages. We have the Carolingian Empire here, which, which may come up later. And we have uh, also the, the Iron Curtain, both of which we have to deal with in the analysis. But just uh, to, to measure psychology, we use questions from the European Social Survey. Um, I won't go the, into the detail, but they asked about conformity and obedience, individualism and independence, impersonal fairness and impersonal trust. So we get variation around through hundreds of thousands of Europeans uh, contemporary, and we see if we can explain the variation in that. And what we find is that regions, so we have 442 European regions that had more exposure to the church, uh, have greater impersonal fairness, greater impersonal trust, less conformity and obedience, and uh, greater individualism and independence. So we're only comparing Europeans and Europeans here. We're just doing it within the same country. And so we're comparing different regions of the same country. We can hold uh, individual demographics, so sex, age, age squared, income and education are important ones. Don't, they don't seem to do much work at all. Um, geography, climate, the influence of Roman roads, initial prosperity. We also put in medieval universities, monasteries and the Carolingian empire. One of, I, one of the most persuasive analyses for me was when we threw out Western Europe and we just do this analysis on Eastern Europe. And we find we can explain this uh, variation in these aspects of psychology within Eastern Europe. Okay, um, we also managed to get some cousin marriage data. 
And so this is the uh, percentage of cousin marriage on a log scale, and that's conformity. So more cousin marriage in Italy, Spain, France, and Turkey, we, we get greater conformity and obedience, less impersonal trust, and less individualism independence, and less uh, impersonal fairness. So interestingly, Turkey, which actually has a very different history, right, from places like France, they fall right where they should be on the plot once we know the rates of cousin marriage. So one of the differences could be this shift in kinship. Um, I'm actually going to just really short circuit this because I'm looking at the clock. Uh, but we did this trick, which is a fantastic trick from economics, where we look only at second generation immigrants. So these are people who grew up their whole lives in Europe, but their parents come from somewhere else. And we can actually tag them to an ethnic group. We tag that individual who grew up entirely in Europe with a kinship intensity or a cousin marriage rate from where their parents came from. And then we can predict aspects of their psychology and control for their income and all that sort of thing. All right. Okay. Now, um, one of the things I wanted to explain in The Weirdest People in the World was the Industrial Revolution. Simple topic, doesn't, shouldn't take long. Uh, and I'm interested in this idea of the collective brain, which I developed in The Secret of Our Success. And there the idea is pretty simple. It's that most innovations are recombinations of different ideas. So the things that should feed into that, you want larger populations, you want more cognitively diverse populations, and you want more free flow amongst individuals so we can get together and swap ideas. Um, so that's the basic idea of the collective brain. And I apply it to so fluid social interactions among cognitively diverse individuals. And I look at the institutions, and I also look at the psychological relationships between innovation and, uh, and those psychological traits. But something like the journeyman institution in Europe is pretty unique because the journeyman phase in an apprenticeship means you've apprenticed under a master, and you're probably, he's probably not your father, which is unlike many places or another kin, kinfolk. And then you have to go to somewhere far away. It's like a postdoc. Uh, go somewhere far away and hang out with a bunch of other people who apprenticed under somebody. Seems like a perfect environment for creating recombinations of diverse ideas. But in elsewhere, if you look at India, you read the literature on apprenticeship there, you look at China, their clans wanted to keep secrets or there were regional specializations. Nobody wanted to share information. Uh, and then finally, the psychological factors that'll create this recombination. Of course, the cr crucial here is, is, is tolerance. Okay, so to try to put this to the test, uh, I started working with Slava Savinsky, who's in the crowd, and Jonathan Schiltz, uh, former postdoc and current postdoc in my lab. And we took the patent database from uh, 1980 to 2014. And this gives us a, let's see, uh, this is, gives us a measure of patents across Europe. And the idea is, is we think that, you know, the social networks which allow people to swap ideas are going to promote more patenting and greater individualism, nonconformity, and impersonal trust, those same measures that I just told you vary around Europe, should lead to more patenting. So does all this psychology stuff I'm talking about on this survey, which you know just could be a bunch of survey answers, does it cash out in more patents? And we also have the same measure. So again, our hands are tied, right? We, we, we already tied our hands in the science paper. So these are the, pat the new patent database that Slava put together. You can see it's these very small nuts three regions in Europe. So uh, over 1,400 regions. And then we have our measures of uh, trust, fairness, individualism, and conformity. And the basic question is, is can we explain the patents using those as a first step? And what we find is that we can take each of these pieces of psychology, and each one of them will explain patents in a regression, holding the country constant and, and other stuff. Um, so a standard deviation increase in weirdness or uh, in, in any of these four traits will lead to between a 0.27 and 0.43 increase in patents. So that's a pretty good increase in patents. And patent here is my measure of innovation. There's been lots of interesting arguments about how good a measure that is, but it does seem to have some, some value. If we do a principal components on these four pieces of psychology and get a single dimension, we get over half a standard deviation increase in patenting across these different regions. So just a quick look at the standard economics table. So this is each of the four uh, and the weird psychology with the principal component. Um, country fixed effects, so only comparing people in the same country. All the standard battery of, of geographic controls and things like that. So that suggests that innovation might be related to psychology. We can do the same thing with our nuclear families. But they still vary across Europe, and, and we have a measure of that. Or we have this measure of Facebook friends. So 
what percentage of Facebook friends are over 100 miles away. And we use that to explain the patterns. So just to give you an example of the kind of result, a one standard deviation increase in far away Facebook friends increases a, by a quarter of a standard deviation patents per capita across these different regions. So this network thing seems to hold, and we think they're co-evolving with the psychology, right? So, so those are correlated. But can we go from the church? So this is our medieval church exposure, bin scatter plot. So each of those dots is a combination of, of dots and patents per capita. So it's a partial regression plot. More church exposure, uh, more patents per capita. Okay, and just the, the long arm of history here. Uh, so patents per capita is the thing we're trying to explain and medieval church exposure is, uh, is we, can, we can still pick up that long arm and I'm making the case that this is due to its effect on psychology and families. This holds even when we use small administrative regions. So these are subnational regions. So we're really only comparing people that live within some small part of Germany rather than all of Germany and all of France, those kinds of things. Okay, um, I took this out, but somehow I must have not saved that version of PowerPoint. Uh, so this I just find amazing, and I'll just mention it here uh, because it's, the slide is here. But we have our centuries under the medieval church, and that predicts patents. But then Jonathan Schiltz had gone through the records, you know, some historians had helped him a lot, and he found that at these different bishoprics, they took attendance when they had a big meeting. And we know all the issues they talked about, the church keeps good written records, at the meeting and we know who attended. So we have an attendance list. So Jonathan was able to put together a data set that has whether the bishops in different parts of Europe actually attended the meetings where incest legislation was discussed. And that picks up some additional variation in patents. So the idea is the bishop goes to the meeting, he gets fired up about stamping out incest. People believed it was causing all kinds of problems, right? So people were marrying their cousins and God was angry. And so he was sending plagues and uh, economic hardship and things like that. So it's like a public health campaign. So we had to get rid of the incest. Okay, now this, uh, I'm always nervous when I present IV regressions in front of economists. Um, so here, here are the ideas. We think that there's a case that can be made that medieval church, the church is kind of expanding idiosyncratically wherever it sees a, a chance to, to kind of get a foothold. And wars are won and lost sometimes by a single battle due to luck. So Maybe this is exogenous, but so we use medieval church exposure to predict aspects of psychology, which it does nicely. I already knew that from the science paper. And then we use the predicted values uh, to predict patents per capita. And it comes out, comes out very nicely. Uh, maybe, the uh, the, uh, maybe this fits the required restriction, um, the exclusion restriction. Uh, maybe it doesn't, but uh, there we, we did that. And we can show the same thing if we do it this way, where we're, where we're looking at the social network data, the Facebook friends or the um, nuclear family households. Uh, so that seems to make the connection there. And then finally, uh, I'll just very briefly touch on this. Um, there's a bunch more analyses in this paper, but one of the things we did was that Carolingian empire, the historians tell us that the, the Carolingians, so this is Charlemagne, 800 CE, he teams up with the church and the popes, and they really try to impose the marriage and family program within the boundaries of the Carolingian empire. And if that story holds, we should be able to find that there's a drop off in patents when you cross the border of the Carolingian empire. So if we can do it for the full sample, but we can also do it for different parts of the Carolingian empire around Europe, and we get the same result in each piece of Europe. Um, and again, you know, keeping country constant, at least for those first couple. Okay. Um, all right. So that is the basic picture. So there I'm making the case that events that happened with how the church transformed the family led to differences in psychology and social structure that have Im implications for innovation today. In the weirdest people in the world, I try to look at different places as well. So kinship intensity varies a lot within China and even among Han, Han Chinese. And researchers, I'm here, I'm drawing mostly on Thomas Talhelm, but, but others uh, have argued that paddy rice agriculture and also um, environmental risk uh, based on monsoons has affects the presence of clans and these lineages that spread after 1000 CE. So paddy rice leads to greater kinship intensity. And Thomas has shown by collecting data all around China that that's associated with uh, greater analytic thinking, uh, more individualistic self-concept and less in-group loyalty. 
So it fits the same pattern of psychological variation if you just look at Han Chinese within China. And it's based here in kinship variation, but not due to the church, due to ecological factors that affect kinship intensity. Since the book, uh, uh, Augustin Bergeron, uh, an economist who, who graduated from Harvard Economics, he has looked at the way in which he's looked at the Democratic Republic of Congo, and he has people living in the same city of Kananga, and he traces them back to their natal villages, and then he asks how close those natal villages are to historical Christian missions. And the closer the natal villages are to the historical Christian missions, the lower the kinship intensity of the individuals, and uh, the higher they are on moral universalism and lower on in-group loyalty. So you see the same pattern just analyzing populations within the DRC, where here the, it's through Christian missions. And then finally, this recent paper uh, by the folks at the University of British Columbia, Goshen colleagues, what they do is they look at state laws. So uh, European populations are expanding across the US and some of them are isolated. There's cousin marriage crops back up because the Protestantism didn't embody the same taboos as the church. Uh, cousin marriage spreads a bit. States impose laws that ban cousin marriage. And he's able to show that that reduces the amount of cousin marriage. And then le that leads to a greater income and urbanization in the longer run. Uh, so that's the Gauche paper. Okay. So uh, final take home messages is that I'm making the case that we can think about culture systematically. It's something we can measure. Uh, it shapes economic and political outcomes. What I actually presented is not a story of historical of historical persistence, but is actually a story of historical change. So the church gets these different peculiar views about marriage and the family, and they then use that to trend or that ends up leading them to transform the families of Europe. And that change then leads to different cultural evolutionary trajectories and economic growth. Um, okay. Crucially, here is the idea that institutions and psychology co-evolve. So our minds have all that plasticity because we're a cultural species and we're responding and, and learning ways to better navigate the cultural worlds that we confront. Um, and it affects lots of features of our, our psychology. And then lastly, uh, you know, the, the place where we're coming from takes evolution very seriously. So you can't get kin-based institutions correct unless you realize we have pair bonding, we have kin-based altruism, uh, and we have incest avoiders, which gives incest taboos their power psychologically. Um, and it also means that kinship institutions will always reassert themselves. So they're somehow more natural than anonymous impersonal institutions where you have to be nice to strangers and things like that. So, uh, okay, so that's it. Any questions? I'm gonna just start with asking one question myself, but because we don't have much time, I want the bulk of the time to be for the audience. And the question I have is, why did you choose to start with the church as a primitive uh, and not other institutions? You know, what, what's the reason why the church was successful in certain places over certain periods? Uh, um, all of these things, as you rightly say, co-evolve. So what makes this the propulsive factor in your mind? Right. Um, well, when you first started to ask your question, I, I was thinking about, you know, in the trajectory of my own thinking. When I first started, I wouldn't have placed any weight on kinship or religion when I was thinking about trying to explain behavior. I started off, you know, studying crop decision making among these uh, slash and burn agriculturalists in Peru. Uh, but then as I kept studying, kinship kept coming back and religion kept coming back as being important. And at the time, I was thinking about why, uh, how I could explain all this psychological variation we were finding. Um, we were... I was beginning a research, pro I wasn't beginning, I was partway through a research project where we were showing how powerful beliefs in God could affect like behavioral game measures and things like that. So I knew religion was important and it seemed to have this direct effect. So I was thinking about what indirect effects it might have. Now to the substance of your question, I think one way with one of the strengths I think of cultural evolution is you can ask the question, why did the church adapt these marriage and family policies? Maybe there's some story that would lead to that. And I'm sure there is an interesting story, but one thing that's valuable is always to zoom out and say, well, what are all the different religious communities in, in that part of the world doing at that time? And they're all kind of monkeying around with marriage and the family in different ways, right? So, so later Islam limits polygyny. So polyg Islam is a polygyny limiting, right? Only four wives, they have to be treated equally. They have an inheritance rule that daughters have to inherit half of what sons inherit. 
Okay. Meanwhile, Zoroastrianism over in Persia is saying it's encouraging sibling uh, marriage. So the elites are marrying their siblings and you know, cousin marriage is encouraged by Zoroastrianism. So that's a different experiment. And you know, each of these groups thinks that this is the right way to live, right? That God wants us to live this way or somehow it's kind of more in tune with the metaphysical structure of the universe. But then, and then history plays out depending on how these things affect things. So there can be lots of interesting random variation. Uh, another example on this line to give you something really non-intuitive is there's this proliferation of religions in the US in the early 19th century. The, today we have the Hutterites and the Mormons are products of that initial, of that process. Most of the other ones have disappeared. My fit, and of course, uh, Mormonism adopts polygyny and, and probably proliferates. They probably have a lot of kids early on in the 19th century. But then there's also the Shakers who ban sex entirely and can only grow by people migrating in. So religion has this tremendous power to manipulate what people do. Um, and it's almost always based on supernatural justifications. So it's a way that culture can experiment with a whole variety of different ways. And then history sorts it out. Thank you. So let's do the following. Let's take uh, questions in groups of three, uh, and then Joe can answer and we see how we go along. So let, can you raise your hand if you will? Okay, so we're going to start with the question down there uh, and then uh, uh, two here. Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious about cooperation and innovation and how that relationship varies in um, kinship intensive societies and uh, others, simply because I'm thinking in societies where there's high intensity of kinship, you're perhaps more likely to build a cooperative system with your larger family. But then that also means that you are not engaging with perspectives beyond that, you know, that there's an opportunity cost to that and that could affect um, innovation. So um, just wanted to know what you think about that. Okay. Hi, um, <clears throat> thinking about these relationship between institutions and individuals, which is similar to the infinite regression of Hodgson, and also thinking about the evolutionary framework, such as the one of his life, where there is a constant component and changing component in individuals. My question is about is if as policymakers, we should also think about how to change from the institutions to the individuals, particularly to the genetics of individuals. What's your take on um, human engineering? Okay. Hello. From the weirdest people in the room, one idea I was really impressed by was the spread of literacy and how you link that to how the brains are changing. And then you made a linkage between that and how people, maybe interpersonal trust and the other metrics that you talked about in the weird index uh, get affected maybe through that channel. And I was curious that today we spend a lot of time looking at videos or maybe data visualizations or just you know we we show little babies like TikTok videos for like four hours or whatever um whether there's any interesting if that's like as big a deal as literacy was when it was introduced whether you think these things are changing our brains and whether there's any interesting predictions for how uh, we might culture and society might change moving forward given that we just stare at different things uh, all the time yeah great um so let me ask the answer the uh, Last question first, which is, I mean, I've seen a little bit of research suggesting that things like Google lead to worse memories. So we're sort of offloading more and more of our memories. Um, people in non-literate societies have remarkably good memories. Uh, and the things we remember may be different. I mean, just what we know already from the way languages affect thought, the way written scripts affect thought, um, it's gotta be mattering. <laughs> it's gonna matter, but I, I haven't seen the research on, on exactly what the details are on the kinds of things you're thinking about. Um, to the first question, yeah, so we've been really focusing on this. And one of the ways we've tackled this is to look at the, the you know, we have the patent database in the U.S. And we can look at each county in the U.S. and use last names or surnames as a measure of how dense the networks are. So we calculate kind of a kinship entropy. Uh, and there are places with many more surnames, uh, more diverse surnames, uh, have much more innovation. 
And you know, we can, you know, we can use the surname diversity at one time to predict innovation at the next time. We can use immigration shocks to get exogenous variation. So we can make causal inference. It holds there. So uh, Bent's kinship networks, while it might promote cooperation, most people in a kinship network have the same information. And the key to innovation is talking to people who think very differently than you and being willing to trust them and tolerate them and all that sort of thing. Uh, the second, I didn't totally understand your question. So uh, institutions and genetics, that's what I remember. Right. Um, well, one of the, so this is uh, one of the interesting things that I think we're seeing that in, there's genetic variation among individuals within a society on say learning styles. So one of the things as we're getting more and more into how genetic uh, specific genes affect cognitive differences, we can tailor programs and policies so we can get the most out of people with different kinds of cognitive abilities by tailoring. Uh, so there's a one size fits all approach to most education, but you can imagine different genes lead to different brains that are better suited to different kinds of education and we can extract more. One of the things I'm working on with a graduate student uh, named TC uh, is when you have a mobile um, division of labor, when people can swap into whatever specialization or occupation they want, you actually see genetic stratification. So we have the UK biobank and whatnot. And it looks like you know um, certain kinds of genes are accumulating, say in tech occupations, and other kinds of genes are accumulating in other occupations. So in some sense, that's harnessing the available genetic material most efficiently. In other societies, your occupation is determined by what mom and dad did or what um, what lineage you are, what your geography is, then you're not harnessing the genetic diversity that's available as well. So that's another way to think about it is how to best harness the, the variation that exists in the genetic culture. Okay. Uh, thank you. I uh, really love the talk. Um, I was I was looking at the weird characteristics you you put in uh, bilateral descent, uh, cousin marriage, monogamous, nuclear families, and your local residents. And I'm wondering, looking at the society, how it's evolving, which of those things will change and how will that affect uh, society and innovation? One of those that seems to be changing is monogamous relationships, nuclear families. I'm not sure if I understood uh, your local res your local residents. Um, but yeah, my question is, which ones of those do you think will change? And what effect will they have? Because there's other societies that you know don't have this. So can we learn from them and see, you know, where are we headed? Right, right. Well, one of the trends that that I think I see is that uh, even monogamous families are breaking down. Right, a lot of individuals are choosing to live just as an individual and not marrying at all. And that's actually taking individualism to its extreme because it used to be the cooperative unit was reduced to the nuclear monogamous family. Now it's just one person who has lots of insurance and other kinds of things to take create the safety net. Um, I'm not sure about that. So were you kind of asking about polyamory and things like that or? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about the, the polyamory. I mean, there does seem to be some numbers suggesting that spreading uh, and polygyny may be legalized at some point. Um, I mean, Canada had a whole court case on this. so. We'll see what happens there. It could be a fun natural experiment. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know. Uh, hi, uh, I, I'm working on a kind of uh, uh, developing the framework of innovation on different locations. Uh, uh, very interesting presentation and uh, try to see the cultural aspect, how it will link with the patent and the location. So I am curious to uh, have your uh, comments. Like for example, uh, Jewish community in Israel, how uh, uh, they are like a similar thought process, etc. Uh, except the academic, technical, other uh, variations, but able to create a, a lot of innovations, patent, etc. And second, in Indian context, uh, religion is one aspect, but the caste, where certain caste people have a, a different kind of uh, standing on these patent data, etc. Okay. Well, so what, what are the what are the findings there? I, I don't know those cases. So, like in in whatever if we see the patent data, uh, most of the uh, one in two particular caste people have more patent uh, right. than the. Of course, the lot of uh, higher education, 
and uh, location bias biases are there. Right. But it, has anybody thought about looking at caste diversity, right? So you could imagine you could look at the interaction among people from different castes or different ethnic groups or different language groups and see if those regions generate more innovation than, than others. Um, hi. So uh, my question was about sort of the marketization of an economy represents a substantial shift from a largely from an equilibrium from 10,000 years we've been agricultural roughly. Um, but we are seeing a development in a sense that is resisting a complete change. So um, in Latin America, and I don't know what will happen in South Asia, we don't know if these complete transitions will happen to these nucleated structures. So I'm kind of curious about how you think kinship is kinship the force that resists this full change? Um, is it something else? I'm trying to get a feel of that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that kinship is part of the story. I, I don't think it's the whole story because I mean, families perform these really valuable functions. And especially if you have a lot of shocks and stuff, families are always gonna reassert themselves because what do you do when you lose your job? What do you do when you break your leg or something and can't work? And in lots of places, the family has always been there. So unless you have all these things like health insurance and unemployment insurance and stuff that can, can take care of those situations, you're always gonna have to have a kinship structure. And then that's gonna lead to a certain psychology and then that's going to inhibit some of these, you know, full market integration and whatnot. So uh, let's take one last question uh, and then I'll conclude with one. Thanks, Professor. So a lot of us in this room are development practitioners and the story you paint is a bit is a bit difficult because it seems like either you have the weird psychology and you're contributing now to this global collective brain that comes with innovation and knowledge sharing and whatnot, uh, or you're not. And so, so what is the path forward for the people who don't necessarily, the cultures, the societies, the countries that don't have these weird psychologies? And what is the path forward for them in terms of economic development? Right. So that's a great question. And one of the points I make in the book, and I always make this, is that, uh, well, weird people tend to be analytic thinkers which means they always reduce things to lines and linear scales. And there's a tendency to think about development as occurring on that linear scale. But what a study of cultural evolution says is you think about trees and bushes and stuff, and there's lots of different ways potentially to generate development. So the path that I've described is one pathway. Um, but I know from, I mean, if you just look at the variety of different human institutions, there's lots of different ways to, to that humans have lived and been successful and flourished and all that kind of thing. So the first thing that I think a cultural evolution approach says is don't think so much about the line, think more like a bush. And are there other pathways through the bush? Um, the second thing is, is that I, I maybe should have emphasized this. I feel like I was planning to, but um, one of the reasons I was so interested in the mechanisms for which you go from the church to innovation and to psychology is that there's these intermediate things like the differences in psychology, the presence of voluntary associations, the shift in networks, all of which one can influence through other means besides deep history, deep religion. So if you know the internal mechanics that lead to impersonal institutions functioning more or reducing corruption, then you can influence the number of faraway Facebook friends or you know these intermediate variables in other ways besides having to change what happened a thousand years ago, right? So that's why you want to get the mechanics right. Okay, so let's try to wrap up. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is a very long-term uh, evolutionary perspective and uh, uh, whether um, you think these uh, non-weird uh, societies and dense kinship networks and so on might eventually have something that's good for humanity. I'm thinking now, for example, of the problem of the environment and how, you know, you one could argue that parts of the a system that we've put in place has led to where we are now. So do you see a future where um, maybe it will be possible to retain the capacity to innovate, but uh, go back to some elements of non-weird societies that are more compatible with um, uh, survival of the planet or you know, equality or yep. other things? So uh, two thoughts on that. One is, I think the more we understand about human nature, the better we're in a position to create things like a notion of global citizenship. 
because uh, I mean, we basically have a kind of tribal psychology. So in The Secret of Our Success, I make the case for where the tribal psychology comes from. But then once you understand that, you can potentially harness that. So that works on certain cues, you know, shared language, shared dress, uh, the other kinds of ideas, shared fate, all of which seem to cue up this tribal psychology. If you can create that at a global level, you might be able to, in, in, you know, get people to solve problems better. And then the other part of this is the family and the kinship structures create that warm sense of feeling. So one of the findings I like, and this comes from the family ties literature, but you know, people are happier when they're in wealthier societies, but they really wanna be in a big family. So the happiest people in the world are living in wealthy societies, materially secure, and have a big family network, right? And so those two things create this interesting tension. Um, but could we create um, local, communities where people feel enmeshed in warm social networks. Uh, now, if you built them out of kinship, I'd worry because nepotism will always reassert itself, but maybe there's some way to build voluntary local communities where people opt in, shared values, that kind of thing, and then, and then help each other in a way that people feel really, uh, they feel better about themselves and about the world. Having lived in these Polynesian villages in, in Fiji and, and, and other places, um, there is this real sense of, you know, your kids are running around, they can eat in any house, and, you know, there's this sense of community that is hard to replicate where I live. And what could, could economics borrow as tool, you know, to move in that direction and study these types of models uh, of growth? For well, I, I think that, I mean, there's really a nice fit has emerged between economics and cultural evolution, because cultural evolution has been formal and mathematical since its origin. It was actually first a whole, it was a body of mathematical theory long before anybody tested anything. And I don't think it takes very many steps to like insert a utility function into a cultural evolutionary model to make the economists feel better if there's a utility function. <laughs> uh, and then the evolution comes in because it can give you inspiration on what the pieces of human psychology that you might need to deal with are. So if you don't have an, a, an understanding of evolution, why are kin-based institutions so strong? Why does nepotism always reassert? Is that just culturally transmitted? No, of course not. It's, it's part of human nature. And the same thing with these other pieces. So, I mean, one other idea that's out there is the notion that we have an interdependence psychology. So we're looking for things that tell us we're interdependent with other people. And so you see this when like war shocks hit. Um, I have this paper looking at different kinds of shocks and, and the effects of war on people's social psychology, and they seem to get more cooperative and, and, and tighter. Um, and that's possibly a product of this interdependence psychology, but if we could figure out how to manipulate that. We could build institutions that sort of turn on that sense of interdependence. Thank you so much. Yeah. Rodi,